I must be getting older. I, I'm still trying to figure out where my sleep went last week and trying to catch up on it, but uh, nothing like a joy to be able to see Christ and give us breath and to be able to praise Him, and, and that we will do this morning. Take your Bibles and open your Bibles to John chapter 11. Significant passage for us to, to concern our hearts with this morning. It's, of course, Jesus living out his deity, his power, uh, the very fact that he can call the dead to life. And beloved, that that's, doesn't get old. It doesn't matter how long you've known Christ. The gospel is to be lived out daily. It enriches our souls. It gives us power to, to, to think rightly and when it comes in conquering sin that tangles your life. And, and so this morning, I just kind of want to Reflect on the importance of that. And the fact that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Pondering this truth, and, and you think about it. It's one of those things for Jesus to say that he can call forth the dead. I mean, you talk about putting his deity on display. I mean, that, that the ability to call someone who's been dead for four days. A lot surrounding this passage, and we looked at that so many months ago, and um, but at, I want to revisit just a couple verses this morning. But let us pray before we do. Father, we again thank you for this time and your word and the ability to thank your thoughts and illumine our minds to, to what you have to say to us this morning. Spirit, teach us. You are the great teacher. You are the player. Kaleo. You are the great helper that comes alongside our souls to, to teach us about your truth and and so we need your divine leading as we look at something that, for the most of us, maybe be familiar, but may it not be so unfamiliar that we lose sight of its power and its glory and its truth and its awesomeness. So draw us to that understanding. Draw us to, to rejoice in your, in your truth and be with your servant as he teaches. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. This was a passage that was given to the kids this week, pointing the reality as, as they studied the Moses and the Exodus and his rising up, and, and yet it's such a powerful passage because we would then take that example on how God used Moses and reflect on Christ and look at the greatness of God's greatest gift that he had a plan and he had a purpose and, and he was determined to have it fulfilled in Jesus. It's about the resurrection, and you think about that. It, the resurrection is often preached about during Easter time, but it, it's just as much as life then as it is now. And, and, and so it's one of those things that I think it's helpful for us to look at these and ponder the depth of the resurrection. Because if you think about it, if the resurrection did not happen, we wouldn't need to gather here this morning. There would be no need for the church. And matter of fact, if as you look and study the scriptures, the resurrection is the hub of all Christianity. The, the very fact that, that Jesus can command those who are dead to life, but yet also exhibit that resurrection in his own life is very powerful. And so the resurrection is pivotal to all that is Christianity. The truth that the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and, and it has great implications for your soul even as you sit here today. That's the beautiful thing about the Word of God. It's, it's living, it's active, and it's sharpened into a devil, a sword is able to judge your thoughts, and, and it's so applicable for our souls this morning. But I think the question is, is, is why? Why the resurrection? Why did Jesus proclaim that he is, the, in fact, the totality of the resurrection? And life. And gives a command that he who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And then if you take a step back further, I mean, what was the, in the divine plan of God when it came to the reality that this is what I'm going to do in sending Jesus as Savior? What was he trying to communicate to us, to the world, to the reality? 
The word resurrection itself means rising from the dead. It means coming back to life. And so how does that play into our souls? How does it play and impact your life? And like I said, it is the pivot, it is the center, it's the hub of all Christianity. If there was no resurrection, all the other truths that Jesus ever spoke would be nullified. Falling to the wayside. The resurrection and the fact that Jesus was going to die was common in Jesus' teaching. Jesus taught his disciples in Mark 8, 3 that the Son of Man must suffer these things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after that, three days rise again. That truth is synonymous with everything that he ever spoke. It it is one of those things where he continued to teach and teach and teach. I'm going to come. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to die. But yet, I'm going to rise Matter of fact, the first two sermons after the resurrection of Jesus preached after Pentecost, both focused on Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Do you think the disciples knew that that was imperative to the truth and the message of the gospel? You better believe it. And I think about that, its implications. The fact that because our Lord has lived, we too, for those who trusted him, will live. That for the Christian, there's no fear in this life because Jesus is alive. A great assurance that comes to those who trust Christ. I think John Locke said it best. He was an 18th century British philosopher who said this. He says, Our Savior's resurrection is truly of great importance in Christianity, so great that his being or not being the Messiah stands or falls with it. End quote. End quote. And so if the resurrection... If the resurrection... What do we, what do, we do it back there? <laughs> and Jesus said, sinners, repent, for the kingdom of God's at hand. But if the resurrection is eliminated, then, then all the life-giving power of the gospel is eliminated. All the things that, like I said earlier, Jesus said and promised and, and, and taught would be for not and void, would be for naught. One of the greatest chapters of the Bible in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is a chapter about the resurrection. And the Apostle Paul said this in verse 19, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are all men most be, be pitied. And what he's saying there is that if the resurrection didn't happen, we would be a sorry group of people. We would be men and women who are pitied because now we follow, if you want to follow, a dead leader. And then on the flip side, it's not possible, therefore, to to be a Christian and not believe in the resurrection. And so this is a beautiful truth for us to to ponder our hearts. And let me read just the two verses that we'll just kind of draw our attention to this morning. Verse 25 and 26. This is Jesus' response to Martha and the reality of her brother dying. Jesus said to, to Martha this, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And then as the compassionate Savior does, he asks her this question, do you believe? Which tells us that the resurrection is a matter of faith. It's a matter of receiving that truth in which Jesus will perform. And and boy, did he perform. He delays his going to Bethany. Why? So he he knows what's going to happen. He knows that, that for their edification, that they need to see his power in action and the very fact that he has command over, over death. But 
the question I want to put before you. What does the resurrection prove? Why does Jesus here proclaim that he is the resurrection of life? And with that profound, profound statement, he provides us in these two verses four resounding truths that we need to understand and believe. And this is kind of a launching point. This is kind of a theology of the resurrection. It's, it's to help you understand, to, to rightly put, as you live out Jesus Christ, if you're saved, to understand exactly the importance of the resurrection in your soul. And yet on the flip side, for those of those who don't believe, those who, who don't understand the resurrection, this, this is a truth and a theology that is redeeming for your soul. For it all starts here. It all starts here. The gospel starts with the fact that Jesus has conquered sin and death. This is the good news that the resurrection proves. But first and foremost, as John has shown us clearly in this gospel, that, the, that Jesus' resurrection proves that he's God. And to think of him any less is blasphemy, beloved. Do you get that? I'll be honest with you. I get tired of people who say that Jesus is a good man. I get tired of people telling me, I was told that this week, that Jesus was a good man who did good things and became a God. In my own soul, that is, that is blasphemy and out of the pit of hell. I'll be honest with you. Because it strips the deity of Jesus. Jesus is God. Nothing short. Nothing short. And the very fact that he can command death from a grave, can you do that? Oh, there's times where I wish I could do that. There are times where I wish that, especially when a little one crying because they lost a dog or, or maybe lost a sibling or, or lost a loved one or lost a grandma, to call forth life. Here's the thing about it. Jesus does. This is the most pinnacle of things that he can do to verify that he was God, for only God can give life, beloved. Only God can speak life into existence. If you look in the New Testament, you'll find a myriad of individuals giving testimony to that reality. I mean, it is littered with the fact that when people interacted with Jesus, they, they saw the divine nature and his attributes and his compassion and his authority and saw his miracles and said, he surely is God. And even his enemies, demons, proclaimed the deity Jesus. The Pharisees, Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day, they had trouble with Jesus. Mark 5 records for us that, that the demons said that Jesus is the son of the most God on high. Profound. His disciples gave testimony to this truth. Peter said this, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. There was worship, there was devotion, there was allegiance to the, to the position of Jesus. Matthew said, he is God with us. Mark said that he is Jesus Christ, the son of God. Luke said he is the son of God. Like time and time again throughout the gospels, you, you hear this affirmation of the deity of Jesus. John the Baptist said, when he saw him from a distance, he says, I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God, and behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Even our text. Martha said, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. Testimony after testimony based on truth. They didn't go to some, some school to figure it out. They lived in front of Christ, and Christ lived in front of them, and he displayed his glory, and they manifested a testimony that he surely is the Son of God. But as strong as those testimonies are, there's, there's one that is, is more powerful than all the others, and that comes from God himself. 
God has declared. And helps us think rightly about Jesus when he says that he is the son of God. Romans 6, 4 tells us that, that, that Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. It reads there, therefore we have, have buried with him through baptism into death. Paul understands the significance of those who are in Christ and how they are buried with him into death. Why? So that Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. You want to give God praise in your life? Speak to the resurrection of Jesus. Speak to the hope of Jesus. You want to give glory to Jesus? Have the gospel on your lips, in your life. Speak to the power that forgiveness comes to those who trust in Jesus. Harmony of the divine hand. I mean, there's so much wrapped around in this truth of what we call the scriptures, and, and we see the divine hand and the leading of God and Jesus and it put on display for us to understand and believe. All of us have a, a theology of death. We know death's going to happen. And what makes death and the reality of Jesus' resurrection so powerful is that he was able to overcome it. He was able to command death to, to release its shackles on his soul. Matter of fact, Ephesians 1 verse 20 says this, it is the power of which he brought about the resurrection of Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand. And then he just loves Jesus' testimony. He's always telling them, I and the Father are one. He claims equity and equality with God. Sure, he had to set aside some of his attributes to, to come in the flesh and, and, and dwell amongst men, but yet he divinely displays who he is. Boy, I've heard a lot of gymnastics, hermeneutical maneuvering when it comes to John 10, 30, when Jesus says, I and the Father are one. It's monogenes in the Greek. Jesus is saying that when you see God the Father, or when you see me, we're equal. It's not hard, beloved. And yet you've got other religions out there got to try to manipulate that because they don't believe that Jesus is divine. At least not at that point. But he is Divinely, the same. And so when Jesus says in John 25, or 11, 25, that I am the resurrection and life, he is saying, look to me, Martha, I am God. I'm God. He has the characteristics to, to bring life, and, and he even delays his going to Bethany so as to make sure that they understand that this was not some hoax, that, that Lazarus was, was taking a long nap. Four days in the grave, Martha rightly says, Lord, don't remove the stone because it's going to stink if you do. And yet he commands the stone he rolled away, and he calls forth Lazarus, and he comes out. And you talk about mouths dropped, hearts full of joy. Profound. That was definitely one of the, the things I would love to see in person, and yet in reality I have. In my own testimony of, of seeing God open the eyes of a dead man. I think we all have that testimony when it comes to our own sinfulness, that if you know Christ, our, our mouth drops open to the reality that Jesus Christ is life. And he's the resurrection, that he has granted forgiveness, and he desires to be your Lord and Savior. 
Jesus displayed this holiness. He displayed an action, a divineness. He, 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 he never loses that. And because he's divine and because he's holy, he calls each and one of us here in this room to be holy as he is holy. A standard of righteousness for those who follow him, a standard of, of perfectness. And his resurrection proves that. His ability to be holy, his ability to, to give life. But that leaves us in a problem, doesn't it? However, there's hope. Again, Jesus' resurrection gives it. It gives hope and life. And to our second point, it, you know, and how does he do that? Because of the reality of our depravity. If Jesus calls us to be holy, and yet we know within ourselves that we cannot do that, we are men to be most pitied because we are going to stand condemned. And yet his resurrection and our ability to trust him and, and, and to follow him gives a depraved man hope. You've heard this. All men are, are, are sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God, Scripture says. The Bible calls our sin rebellion against the holiness and righteousness of God. Sin means, means, means missing the mark. And you've got to ask yourself, what mark is he calling us? Well, 1 Peter 1.16, to be holy. We miss that mark day in and day out. We don't have to live with ourselves very long to know that, that we are consumed with our flesh and our sinful desires, that desires to, to, to lash out. That hurts, doesn't it? That's not a good message to, to swallow. For man desires to, to dress itself up and, and, and present itself good to the world. But the Bible exposes the inwardness of our hearts and says that we are totally depraved. First Kings 8 says there is no man who does not sin. Romans 3.23 says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All. No man. Complete human race in the realm of total depravity. And yet on the flip side, you have a holy God, you got Jesus, you got, you got the Trinity, you got the Holy Spirit, and they're all commanding holiness and righteousness, and rightfully so. For they are one who have not sinned one ounce. Perfect. And in light of those two streams, man is totally helpless. Standing commitment. Something's running above us. Standing in judgment. Matter of fact, for God's holiness and justice, it demands that all sin be punished by death. And that's exactly what he says in Romans 6.23. For the wages or the payment of sin for one sin is death. Is death. Ezekiel 18 says this, the soul who sins will die. And yet here's the beauty of the gospel. Here's the beauty of the good news that in, in that state of, of man's total depravity and man's inability to do anything but to sin, here comes the good news. Here comes Jesus, the deliverer the Redeemer, the one who will redeem your soul from that penalty from hell. I don't know if I'm going to step on some toes here, but Jesus didn't come to, to have a, a wonderful plan for your life. Jesus didn't come so that you can have ice cream and have the joy of fellowship. Jesus didn't come so you can have a comfortable Christian life. 
Jesus came to redeem you from your sin. Are there benefits from being in Christ? Absolutely. But don't lose that truth. You needed Christ. You need Jesus. We are totally depraved. James says it this way, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at one point, he has become guilty of all. So just seeing the kids' faces as we taught this truth this week. How many of you ever said a lie? Hands kind of just half cocked. I said raise them high because you're all liars. And they did. (laughs) That one sin and the confession of that one sin condemns them of the whole law. I remember that as a young 16-year-old. Never so pointed in my life. I don't think I've shared this with my kids. Age of 16, at a home that was repossessed by the federal government. My buddy said they were just moving from house to house. So now we get caught. Cops come, we're drinking illegal beverages. And the cop comes out, and there's beer cans everywhere. I wasn't smart enough or fast enough to run, and so I get caught. And I think it was God's hand in my life. Age of 16. I had quite a few beers that night. And the officer said, son, have you been drinking? After getting some information and all this kind of stuff. And I think to myself, man, if I tell him how much I've drunk, I'm really going to get in trouble. So the wise young bear said, yes, sir, I've had one beer tonight. He said, that's all I need to know. And he starts writing his ticket. I'm saying, well, what are you doing? I only had one. He goes, it only takes one, son. One sin condemns us from the whole law and brings just and God's holiness and wrath upon us. James again says, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of it all. Jesus' resurrection gives men like me hope because he can give life. And more importantly, it points to him as the reality that he is Savior. Savior. For him to be able to to show his divine goodness and and, and call people from the dead and and himself rise from the dead points to the reality that there is salvation in no one else. Matter of fact, Peter says that. Acts 4.12, there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. No other name. That's why I squirm in my own heart, in my own life, when, when somebody exalts somebody who does good because that goodness falls short to the righteousness and, and the lordship of Jesus. I squirm when somebody says, you know what, they're of another religion, but, but they're good people. And the reality is, is that they are sinners condemned to hell. And you can put... Whatever spin you want on it, the the, the reality is is that they stand in judgment. And here's the power of the gospel, the fact that Jesus has come to be Savior. 1 Peter 3.18 says, Christ died for, for sins once and for all. For the just, for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God. There is the gospel, the ability for Jesus to die once, He doesn't continually die in your life. You don't need to continually come to Christ. You need to come to Jesus once and stay there knowing that his power will save you. Christ died for sins once and for all, for the just, the just him himself, for the unjust, us depraved individuals, in order that he might bring us to God. That's profound. Christ's death satisfies the demands of God's justice 
And because he died on the cross, it enables us to live through his righteousness and his imputed holiness. And now we can stand holy in front of God. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but what? But what? Have eternal life. Eternal life. Romans 4 tells us he was delivered up because of our transgressions, because of our sins, and when he was raised because of our justification. Well, but I know what's going on in our minds. We, we, we understand that those words sins and transgressions, those are not tolerable words today. Matter of fact, those are dividing words. Nobody likes to, to see the reality of where we actually are in light of our depravity. And yet the scriptures don't cover it up. And I think about that. In order for God to make us justified, in order for God to make a sinful sinner justifiable to a holy God, he had to send Jesus, and Jesus had to resurrect from the dead. He was raised in order that we may be in the sight of God as being made righteous, atoned for, forgiven, that we can be, in God's eyes, seen without sin, justified in Christ's righteousness in our lives. Powerful truth, isn't it? Powerful truth. This is the message that you have been given as ambassadors to Jesus. This message of reconciliation, the message of hope, the message of reality that you can have hope in Jesus as being your Savior. Foundational. Foundational for every preacher that follows Jesus Christ. Let me say it to this way. Let me just kind of take a different approach to this a little bit. The resurrection, if you think about it, is the single doctrine that elevates Christianity above all other religions. Think about that. No other religion has their guru or their savior rising from the dead. Do you realize that? is the fact that Muhammad died. One of his followers recounts his burial that when Buddha died, it was with utter passing away, which nothing remains. Death was the end of Buddha's life. Muhammad. Muhammad died at Medina on June 8th, 632. And guess what? Tens of thousands of people still go to Mecca to worship a dead guy. And you know what's interesting about that? They don't mourn, or they don't come to celebrate his resurrection. They come to mourn as what is death. You name it. How about Joseph Smith? Has a grave where his bones are contained. Gandhi is dead, mourned at his gravesite. You name it. Graves of what supposedly people give their lives to, where people go and mourn the death. And however, beloved, we don't have a Savior who's in the grave. We have a Savior who's alive. We have a Savior who, who sits at the right hand of God, ever making intercession for us. We have a Savior who is resurrected. Makes it powerful. He's the savior of the world. He's the savior of those who trust and believe in him. John, uh, Jesus said this in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. No one. There's not a circuitous route to God. 
Where does that leave us? We've got some kids coming down to sing us some songs and just recount the truth that they learned at VBS. Where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us with a, a demand of a decision. You're sitting here, you're absorbing this truth, and just as, as Jesus was consoling Martha, but yet teaching her about the truth of the resurrection, he ends with this in verse 26, do you believe? Do you believe? The resurrection isn't some, some good feel story left to be put on a shelf and celebrated during March or April. It is something to impact your souls today. And it's meant to be believed in. And unfortunately, there are many who don't. But Jesus' resurrection demands an answer from your soul. Either you deny that Jesus says who he is and the truth about his resurrection, or you receive it. It's as simple as that. Either you believe that that was all a hoax and a lie, or you believe that that is the source of life. And the question is, do you believe? Do you believe? All right, Father, we uh, have considered this truth about the resurrection. We marvel at the fact that you are truly king, that you're God. And I know, Lord, that there are some here who are pondering that reality some want to believe, and yet they struggle with their own depravity and sin and hanging on to a lifestyle or a decision that they see more acceptable. And yet, Spirit, I pray that you squash that. We're never truly more alive than we are in Jesus Christ. It seems odd that we would would commit our souls and receive grace from one who died, but yet the reality of his death and what it accomplished in the resurrection is the whole meaning of the good news, that we are saved, that we're redeemed, that we have been bought by the blood of the Lamb. And that has a deep theological bearing because it is your truth, God. Oh, I pray for listening ears and hearts that that they would wrestle with that. I pray for those Christians who have in their minds said, I trust you, Jesus, but but yet they live accordingly to the world. And and yet, Lord, I pray that you help them to see that the impact of the resurrection has brought transformation that we're now, as you have called us to be holy, they are now to be holy. Exhibiting the righteousness of God living in the power of the Spirit, having the compassion of Jesus. Love, I love, I love you. I love Christianity, the fact that we can follow Christ and and understand that, that there's transformation that happens. You don't leave us in that depraved state, but yet you've given us the ability to conquer it and mortify it and kill our sin and the ability to live more righteously for the king. You have equipped us with the Holy Spirit. You you have, you have, you have. And yet what saddens my heart is that there are some who have not received. And Jesus, I'm asking that you will show show yourself clearly to them. That you will display your glory to them. That they would understand and have their minds illumined that you are truly the resurrection and the life. And that he who believes in you will not die, but truly live. Thank you, Jesus, for that truth. Thank you for the reality of all that you're doing. May we grow in our understanding. May we live for the transformation of the gospel. We pray this with Jesus, with with you on our minds and our hearts and our thoughts. 
We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. If you have questions about the gospel, by all means, you need to come, and I beg of you to come and talk to me about those things. I think we're going to receive these little ones. We're going to need to move this, this podium and ask a couple strapping men to come forth.